Is your portfolio in for more pain for 2023? There's no doubt that 2022 was one of the hardest years for traders of all experience levels. So it's only right that on the first trading day of 2023, we check in with the stock market, see what kind of start it had, why I believe there is more pain coming, what are the major upcoming catalysts for January and February. We'll obviously dive into technical analysis because at the end of the day, it is ATA Tuesday. We'll also take a look at some of the vital data points like the yield curves. We'll dive into what Michael Burry said about 2023, how he thinks that inflation is actually going to return due to what the Fed's actions are going to be in 2023. So we'll dive into that. Tesla obviously starting the year tanking double digit percentages and why I think there's still more pain to come for Apple. And lastly, we'll round off the video with some good news because I do think that 2023 is going to present life changing opportunities. So without further ado, let's get right into it. All right, welcome back to The Traveling Trader. Happy New Year, you guys. Excited to get into this first video on the first trading day of the year. For those that are new to the channel, welcome. We provide non-BS regular market updates. For those that are not following me on Instagram and Twitter, you should follow me on there for daily trading and finance content. For example, back in November, I told you when I was gonna short the SPY, the S&P 500, and we were patiently waiting for this level. You see Mr. Burns here waiting for the SPY to get to our level. And the last stock that I shorted was Netflix. Netflix, I gave that out on Instagram as well. So it behooves you to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Also, if you want our free watch list that I send every single week, it's our stock market update. Go to the link tree link that you see below in the description and I'll send it to you absolutely free. So the stock market had a rocky first day. We have the S&P 500 down about half a percent, NASDAQ down about three quarters of a percent, and the Dow Jones down about 0.1%. Now, why did that happen? Because the stock market actually started green. Well, the US construction spending numbers came out and it shows that US construction spending actually went up when the consensus estimate was that it would actually decline. Now, we're in this era where good news is bad news because any amount of good news as it relates to spending or employment means that the Fed actually has to keep rates higher for longer and that what they have done so far isn't exactly working yet. So that to me is the real backdrop of 2023 and why I think there is more pain to come at least for the first half. Now, before I actually give you specifics and dive into the data and the charts, here are some of the upcoming major catalyst dates for January and February. January 12th, remember we have CPI. We will be live on CPI, of course. CPI is the inflation report. On February 1st, we have the FOMC. That is the first Fed meeting of 2023. This one is going to be extremely vital because we are finally going to see whether the Fed is actually going to go ahead and hike yet again. Remember, we're on the fastest pace of rate hikes ever in the history of the Fed. So we will see if the Fed actually has the guts to hike yet again or will they pause and try to keep rates higher for longer? Now, I think if they do pause, the market will see a quick rebound, but that rebound, in my view, won't last, and I'll dive into some of the deeper details of the data that we have as to why that is. But in my view, the Fed is not going to cut rates, i.e. pivot. That is just a fantasy. We have to believe the Fed when they say that they have to keep rates higher for longer. And if you've been following this channel, you know that the Fed funds rate has to be above the CPI before the Fed even thinks of pivoting, and we are not there at all. And then on February 14th, we have the next CPI data. So those are the three dates to keep in mind for January and February. All right, let's get into the technical analysis. And for those of you that are just beginners with TA, don't worry, this is going to be beginner friendly. And more importantly, we're going to get into the data points that you have to keep on your radar. You cannot have a portfolio in 2023, in my opinion, without knowing these data points. So here we go. As we expected, I showed you the, the tweet that I had back in November. So this is now two months away that I marked this place where I was going to short the S&P 500. Currently, I have a SPY short and a QQQ short in the form of debit put spreads. Those are still open. We hit that level, got rejected, and now we are forming a bear flag. This to me is still very bearish. And it will be so, I think, in, in my view, until at least January 12th, when the next CPI report comes out. We could break down or we could trade sideways in this range until January 12th. Now, if the Fed actually pauses on January 12th and, say, and says, we're going to keep the rates here, we're not going to drop them, but we're going to keep them and see what happens, I do think that the market will see a quick and pretty violent rebound, even though, in my view, it will be short-lived. 
If the Fed actually increases yet again, I think that the tanking will continue. Remember, the Fed's role is to curb spending and increase unemployment, two things that have not yet happened. And going back to the important dates on Friday, January 6th, we have the first jobs report coming out as well. So that will tell us whether unemployment is ticking up or not. All right, let's get into the juicy stuff. I posted this on my Twitter as well. But the federal funds effective rate now has crossed with the two-year treasury. Why is this important? Again, for beginners, don't get lost. I'm going to break it down in a beginner-friendly way. The effective federal funds rate is essentially the overnight rate. That is the rate which banks pay each other when they want to borrow money from each other overnight. See, banks have reserve requirements and it's very common for, for some banks to be low on cash and for other banks to have a surplus of cash at the end of the night. So in order to satisfy reserve requirements, they have to borrow money from each other. So the federal funds effective rate, i.e. what the Fed actually raises or drops during FOMC meetings is actually the overnight lending rate. Now, when the two-year treasury falls below the overnight rate, that means that why would banks even buy or invest in two-year treasuries when they're getting paid more overnight? That is wild. These are the types of dislocations that happen in the treasury market when we are close to a recession because institutions as well as investors fear putting their money in something that is directly affected by interest rates. Short-term treasuries like the two-year and the three-month, when interest rates go up, those rates tend to go up immediately. And so why would someone invest in a two-year or a three-month when those when they know that in the coming months those are likely to go up also they would rather investors would rather secure the money for longer and that's why they pour into say the 10-year treasuries and that's how you get a treasury yield curve inversion where the 10-year treasury actually pays less than the two-year treasury because more investors are pumping money into the 10-year treasury and not in the two-year treasury thereby the two-year rates soaring and the 10-year rates declining, right? When in normal circumstances, obviously the 10-year, the longer one, is supposed to pay you more than the two-year. Anyway, so in my view, we're just getting started here because we just crossed. But if you look at previous recessions, whether the, the dot-com recession or the 2008 recession, the Fed funds rate actually has to be above the two-year treasury for quite some time before we actually hit recession territory. So I do think that, that we do have more pain to come. Just know this if you are a beginner, that the more that the bond market is broken, the more that, the, that things in the economy break because treasuries are really the backbone of our currency. And treasury yields are also the way that banks set interest rates for different things such as cars and houses, et cetera. Okay, one other reason why I think there's actually more pain to come for stocks and why I think that an investor can actually afford to wait. Now, if you bought in October, that was the last time that I bought, that's fine but I, I'm not going to be buying stocks here at a, prices that are much higher than October. I'm going to either wait for matched lows or new lows, which in my view, I think are coming. Here's another reason why. Now, if we take a look at the 10-year three-month, right? This is the inversion between the 10-year treasury and the three-month. Right now, the three-month is paying more than the 10-year because remember, investors are pouring into the 10-year to lock up their money for a longer amount of time because they're more scared about what's going to happen in the short term. And so the three-month treasury yields spike because when investors ignore a certain treasury, the treasury yields start going up in order to finally entice investors. Now, at some point, those yields are going to grow so much that investors will finally start buying the, the three-month treasuries and the 10-year rates will go up like normal, and the 10-year rates will finally be above the three-month treasuries again. And so you can see here that when we actually hit a recession, it's always when we climb out of that inversion on the 10-year three-month. So in my view, for sure, we will see a recession, but we won't see a recession, in my view, until the 10-year actually climbs above the three-month again. You see back here in the early 90s, you also see here in the dot-com crash and in the 2008 financial crisis, right? It's not until 
the 10 year is actually above the three month once again, and we are above this black line that we finally hit a recession. And that is the point at which the Fed actually pivots, right? So the Fed is not going to pivot until things are already broken. And by things being broken means unemployment has gone up. All of the yield curves have inverted. The Fed funds rate is finally above CPI. And that is when the Fed will actually pivot. And I posted this on Twitter as well, showing that every single time that the Fed had hiked rates, they did not stop until the Fed funds rate was above CPI. This time is no different, especially since this is the highest CPI that we've had since the early 80s, right? In 41 or 42 years. So back to this chart, in my view, I do think eventually we have more room to drop. And as I've been saying all last year, I drew this dotted orange line here. I do think that we will eventually get back to pre-COVID highs and we will lose all of the gains that we had after COVID. All right, so now let's get into what Michael Burry actually said, and it ties into what we just discussed with regards to the treasuries, the Fed funds rate, and the Fed. Michael Burry tweeted, he said, inflation peaked, but it is not the last peak of the cycle. We are likely to see CPI lower, possibly negative in the second half of 2023, and the US in a recession by any definition. He's right about that. I showed you the metrics of how close to a recession we are when the yield curves start acting as they do. The Fed will cut and government will stimulate and we will have another inflation spike. It's not hard. Now, I know that Michael Burry tends to be hyperbolic, but here's why there's actually precedent to what he's saying. So in the mid 70s, when we had double digit inflation in 1974, inflation was 11%. And then we raised rates and then we started cutting rates and inflation finally went back to not a normalized rate, right? The target is 2%, but inflation started dropping to single digits and we dropped all the way to 5.8%. Everyone was rejoicing, but then what happened? Right after that, the Fed cut rates thinking that their fight with inflation was over but inflation is as sticky as a mother lover. And inflation crept back up by 1979 to double digits again, 11.3% in 79, 13.5% in 1980. And that's when Paul Volcker finally said, F this, we're going to 20% inflation uh, Fed funds rate. And at the time, this 20% was actually very unpopular. And he was seen as just like some economists are now saying that Jerome Powell's breaking the economy, um, he was seen as rather a raider, cowboy type Fed chairman raising the Fed funds rate to 20%, but he had enough. He's like, no way, we're not going to deal with double digit inflation ever again. So he raised it to 20%. Inflation finally came down to around a 3% to 3.5% target. So Michael Burry's not wrong here because we do have precedent for this. And the money printing that went on during the pandemic was uh, unprecedented. We've never seen money printing like that, right? And the Fed balance sheet, the addition to the Fed balance sheet, we've never seen the Fed buy up so many assets, $9 trillion on their balance sheet. So I can see what he's saying and why he would say that, and he does actually have a point. And this brings me to this last point, though, that even with all of this, let me go back to my stat sheet. If we take a look at a 60-40 portfolio, meaning 60% stocks, 40% bonds, even with all of that inflation, all of that ugliness, this goes all the way back to 1928. So this includes the Great Depression. This includes World War II. This includes the Vietnam War. This includes the savings and loan crisis the dot-com crash, the great financial crisis of 2008, even with all of that, we've never had back-to-back -back years of 20% or more in the loss column, right? And for 2022, this was the worst year since 1931 at 20.4% down for a 60-40 portfolio, assuming we're talking about the S&P 500 and the 40% being a 10-year treasury, right? We've never seen back-to-back -back years of 20% down. As a matter of fact, after 20% down years, we've seen some of the best growth cycles in a 60-40 portfolio. You look at this in 1931, it was down 27.3. 1933, 30%, 31% gain, 2.5%, 30%, 21% gain, right? And then another down year, 20%. 19% gain the following year, 1.1%. 
and so on and so forth. We have many more up years than down years. So in my view, even with all of that, it does not mean that the stock market cannot actually see uh, see growth or optimism. There's only so much that the U.S. stock market and that companies can be devalued, right? And we've seen dot-com level crashes on most stocks. It's only the resilient stocks, such as the Apples and Microsofts, and some of the Dow Jones stocks, right? Some of the oil stocks that have kept us afloat. Also drops of 20% or more in the stock market are very uncommon. We've only had 13 in the history of the stock market. And we're talking about the S&P 500 here. And most of them have peaked at 30% down. We've actually only had one that was more than 50% down. When the Fed pivots, that is a reason to go all in on stocks and also on two-year treasuries. As I've stated before, I will be buying two-year treasury note futures. I will be loading the boat on that. To me, that is even a more surefire play than, than stocks if you look at the data. And lastly, I'll talk about Tesla and Apple. Tesla missing deliveries actually down over 12% today. Now, they did miss deliveries for Q4, delivery estimates for Q4, but they actually saw a 40% growth in deliveries year over year. So still in, in growing at an insane clip, but they did come shy of analyst expectations. And this is more of a foreshadowing of what they think is going to come in terms of demand destruction for expensive equipment or expensive commodities, I should say, like uh, Tesla cars. And in terms of Tesla, like I said on Twitter, I think you want to see multiple weeks of consolidation. This is the weekly chart in Tesla. Looks like a falling knife. You want to see multiple weeks at the same level for me to feel comfortable uh, buying into Tesla heavy. And I would not be surprised to see it in the $65 to $90 range, as I stated back here last month. Now, in terms of Apple, this is one of the ugliest charts on the market, not only because it's so erratic, it's actually very hard to trade Apple because it does not have dynamic and sticky moves, right? The, the chart looks like a heart rate monitor. And so it, it's not like it has these impulsive moves that make you feel comfortable holding a long-term short position or a long-term long position uh, during you know the, the times that it is acting so choppy. But we created this huge head and shoulders pattern, and there is this gap here between 95 and 100 bucks that I'm eyeing, which also coincides with the, the golden pocket. So this is around the level that I will be looking to accumulate more Apple. I do think that Apple can actually break down. Obviously, this depends on what happens with the FOMC meeting. If Jerome Powell pauses, then I, you know, I think that we will see an interim rally in the market. If they cut, which is very unlikely, I do think that the market will rally uh, for quite a while. Um, but if they stay the course and actually raise, even if it's a small raise, then I do think the market will continue to tank. Anyway, traders, a lot, a lot, a lot to get into in this video. Hopefully you got something out of it. Any questions you have, leave it in the comment section below. I will be happy to answer it for you guys. Thank you guys for sticking around. Again, to get my weekly stock market update absolutely free, check out the link tree link in the description below. In exchange for your email address, I will send you the actual weekly watch list straight to your email every single week. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram for daily free trading and finance content, plus lit stories, let's be honest. This is a new edition of this hat. I do love the large embroidery that you see here. This is not a sticker, this is actually stitched. And it came out really nice, if I say so myself. So make sure you head over to thetravelingtrader.com. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Stay safe out there, traders. Peace.